Good evening, and welcome to our continuing series, <coughs> Explorations in Savitri. As always, with our beloved brother, Alok. Yesterday we began Book 3, the Book of the Divine Mother, Canto 1, The Pursuit of the Unknowable, and today we will complete this canto. Yes. So we are on page 307, about yeah. two-thirds of the way down. So as we see, the unknowable is all the realms which are beyond the, even the highest mind. That means all that is beyond the over mind, to use Shurabindo's uh, terminology. So the supramental and the higher world still beyond the worlds of truth, the worlds of bliss, the worlds of pure consciousness and of course the Satchidananda and the Parabrahma, all this goes beyond. So it's um, uh, approx roughly it is described as transcendent. So we have the individual and we have the cosmic. The cosmic is the over mind and below. It contains everything within itself and we have the transcendent. So transcendent is all that is beyond. So it transcends. It transcends all our sensory knowledge, our intellectual knowledge, our mind and all that we can know um, through the mind, even at its highest, even beyond the intuitive realm. By intuition, one can have a hint that there is this beyond, but you can't enter into it. You have to go still further. But this one is, <clears throat> this passage especially, uh, it's almost foreboding. Yes, so that's the beauty. I always say that, you know, who could express the unknowable yeah. in such terms which are, which become so yeah. <laughs> intimate and near to us. Yes. Um, we see their description in the Vedas, neti, neti, not this, not this. Mm -hmm. Or we have another description, all this, all this, this too, this too, iti, iti. But here Shubindu for the first time describes in great detail yes. what it is and yet what it is not and it is beyond is and is not. That, that's the whole beauty of this. Because the moment we try to define it, we lose it. Another very interesting word we read is um, where nothing made could live. So here made has to be seen in the sense that all that is made by the mind because there is something called a self-born. In spiritual terms, self-born, swambhu. That which manifests itself out of itself. So there are Godheads, even in the supramental realms. There are beings even in the bliss self, but they are not made. They are the original self-manifestation of the divine. All the rest becomes made. So all the mind and below, it doesn't, you know, cannot live there, cannot enter. That's why when we often use the word falsehood in a very crass way, and the mother says that all these quotes, mental, vital, physical, they are all full of falsehood. It's built out of, it doesn't uh, reveal the truth to us. It always distorts, conceals, shows us an appearance, but the totality which alone truth is, it's not revealed. So this is the second aspect. And the third is a dizzy verge. That's why yoga has to be undertaken when there is a call for the yoga. One reason is that the contact with the higher consciousness can be extremely disorienting. We have a certain measure by which we lead our life and it's our safety zone, comfort zone. But the moment we enter into the touch of the infinite, these measures fall away. Nothing finite, you know. We may still follow it because it's necessary, but we know that it doesn't contain an absolute truth. So it just falls away and to those who are not ready, it can be very disorienting. That's why people who bracket life into neat categories, good and bad, right and wrong, moral and social and religious, scriptural, even they vanish there. And Mother says that it's very difficult for these human beings to enter into this realm because um, we want a foothold. Mind needs a foothold to navigate through life. But the moment it's face to face with the infinite, it doesn't know. Yes. It's like when you plunge in the middle of the sea, before you take a plunge, you know, this is shore, there is sea, this is Bay of Bengal, this is east, west, north, south. Take a dip and see. 
I, I mean, I, I know it by personal experience. You won't know the above and the below and the right and the left and the west and the east. You just won't know what's happening till you resurface again. So that experience in a much, much vaster way. And the closest that I remember is one of Medhananda's experience. You know how disorienting going beyond our limited frame of reference can be. Uh, Medhananda, as we as we know, he was uh, he was a British or uh, German. 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 So he had this um, tendency to go out of the body and travel into celestial worlds and different uh, systems and universes. <laughs> and mother had cautioned him against it, but. Once when he had gone, he couldn't find his way back. He doesn't know. There is no GPS to say this is earth. It's a small dot. So he asks and he doesn't know how to reach till he encounters two beings. Obviously not this worldly. Tall beings. And he tries to explain to them what earth is. They don't understand. And then after a while they say, Oh, Shurabindu's earth. Yes. Back to the body. <laughs> so it's it can be completely disorienting when we are in, in those realms. And that's why a long preparation is required for yoga. All this equanimity and all these practices, peace, uh, steadiness, strength. Because otherwise we can be completely lost. And of course, after a while, a new consciousness begins to emerge. That's what we read last time. That either we can lose ourselves completely into it, one path, or we can be rebuilt in a new way, a new mind and a body in the city of God. That's how Savitri elsewhere describes. And we have stopped here. The separate self must melt or be reborn into a truth beyond the mind's appeal. All glory of outline, sweetness of harmony, rejected like a grace of trivial notes, expunged from being silence, new, austere, died into a fine and blissful nothingness. So what happens to beauty? Beauty is rediscovered in its formless essence. Shurabindu was asked this question. Normally with beauty we think of outline, form, even if it's mental form. I was reading that very thing today. Yes. So he says beauty in its truth, it exists in its formless essence. But we cannot imagine beauty without some form. Something should be there. Without that, how do you say beauty? The demiurges lost their names and forms. So these demiurges are the great uh, creators. You know, we have the Holy Trinity. Uh, Brahma, Vishnu, Mahesh. So what ha happens to them? So Brahma in that becomes infinite existence. What happens to Vishnu? So all of them, they, they enter into their infinity where they lose their names. Out of that they have immersed. But they lose that um, the way we understand them from the over mind and below. So these are the demiurges, they lose their name and form. You can experience them but as very different, like an absolute of Shiva, absolute of Vishnu, absolute of Brahma, to use the Indian pantheon and something similar is there in every different systems. The great schemed worlds that they had planned and wrought, passed, taken and abolished one by one. What to speak of me and mine? You see, you see this is a very humbling and a canto which, which can chastise us. Uh, very often I see people who come and you know they want to know yoga and what am I supposed to do? I, I, I will do it. I will do reject. I will put in that effort. Well, in the beginning it works like that. <laughs> After a while you discover <laughs> this I is the problem. <laughs> Always the divine is there doing everything. And we give so much importance to this little I. Which actually, if you see the infinity, that touch of infinity frees us from that. You will wonder where is this I? Gone. Like the article 370. <laughs> so strongly held and vanished. You don't know where it goes. <laughs> of course, the ego resists. <laughs> Everything in creation is a wonderful example. You know, we can understand.
<laughs> Once mother was with me in a dream experience and uh, she was showing me all these universes. Vastness like I've never seen. And then she says to me, I have shown you the diversity in order that you may realize the unity. Yes. And it's so humbling. So humbling. And it's surprising that, you know, after receiving this touch, we can still hold on to that eye as something so precious. So, so. And now comes the supramental Godhead who stands at the gates of the unknowable, through whom we pass into the ultimate mystery which has no name. So there is a beautiful description. The universe removed its colored veil and at the unimaginable end, you can't even imagine it, leave aside conceiving it. Mm. Look at the perfection of Shirobindo's words, unimaginable. And of the huge riddle of created things appeared the far-seen Godhead of the whole. He is far-seen because even at an intuitive realm you can get a sense. Now he appears close to his right face to face. Far-seen Godhead of the whole. Perhaps he is the Aditya whom one has worshipped in ancient Indian thought. From whom all has evolved. Far-seen Godhead. And he is whole of the whole. Complete. He is not one aspect or another aspect or a third aspect. But he wraps within himself all the different aspects of the one. His feet firm based on life's stupendous wings, omnipotent, a lonely seer of time, inward, inscrutable, with diamond gaze. We see all the aspects of the supramental, omnipotent, lonely seer, you know, sun, the supramental sun is often described, you can see all sides, all around it. And, and I've always felt the, that line about his feet, mm. firm based on life's, life's stupendous, stupendous wings. wings. Yes. And of course we have uh, the diamond gaze, attracted by the unfathomable regard, the unsolved slow cycles to their fount returned, to rise again from that invisible sea. <coughs> Very overwhelming lines, all the cycles returning, yes. you know, <laughs> like lost cattle <laughs> back to the master. It's cycles, not just uh, an individual life. All the cycles of creation are surging up to him, entering into that sea and once again coming back. You know, some of the lines of Shubindo are so powerful and overwhelming in this poem called Parbrahman, he describes it in this way. He is, we cannot say, nor he is not. For nothing too is a conception of himself unguessed. Both time and timelessness sink in that sea. Time becomes a wave. Space, a wandering drop. How can we imagine the consciousness of someone who wrote this, who experienced it? That's why such profound humility is required when we stand face to face with the Divine. Looking at all this, uh, I feel the most logical, the most rational thing that a human being can do is to surrender oneself to the Divine. It's rational because <laughs> look at the limitlessness. <clears throat> All from his Pusa born was now undone. Nothing remained, the cosmic mind conceived. So what happens is that from the transcendent, like seeds, truths are cast, like idea forces into the cosmic mind. And from there, they are 
unleashed into creation. But where have they come from? From the transcendent. Now, all that is absorbed back into the origin, into the source. Call it by whatever name, doesn't matter. From there they are cast and they are absorbed back. That's the beauty of uh, when mother speaks of new creation, means from this transcendent, a new seed has been sown into the cosmic mind, which is going to change the entire balance of things. It is the hour of God. She says that when the old bases get shaken, because a new thing has been introduced within the realm of the, the cosmic mind didn't even know, it cannot know that something like that exists. It can only know what is received by it from above. Eternity prepared to fade and seemed a you and imposition on the void. Space was the fluttering of a dream that sang before its ending into nothing's deeps. So it's beyond time and space. The spirit that dies not and the Godhead self seemed myths projected from the unknowable. So even the gods are withdrawn. That's why in ancient Indian thought, this cycle is returning back. Um, you know, we normally hear about pralayas when an entire universe is dissolved. Uh, but there is something also known as Mahapralaya. So pralaya is when the uh, physical universe, material universe is, you know, dissolved, yes, yeah. sunk. But Mahapralaya, when even the gods and the higher planes are withdrawn into their origin. So that means an entirely new cycle is going to begin. So even these gods, high gods, they have a certain term. They don't die, they are deathless, but they are absorbed back into the, their original essence from which they are cast back into creation. From it all sprang, in it is called to cease, but what that was, no thought nor sight could tell. Only a formless form of self was left, like a small little uh, line on water, drawn water, formless form. You can sense that there is something going to take place. There is a, like, you know, before the creative expression, when people, the, the best way to understand is uh, this, this particular line, what that state could be, that everybody who creates, you know, before creating, be it a painting or a poem, anything of that kind, there is a state when you brood upon that thought. Then there is a point when you, uh, it's gone into some kind of a quietude. And that time you ask that, what are you thinking or what are you planning to create? And you say, yeah, I have got some idea. You ask to define the idea, it's a vague idea. It's there, you know there is something, but you can't define it now. And then you sit with the paper or pen or the brush and what comes out is a marvel. So that state when the form, formless in the form, this is the border. And mother at one place says it's from this high border that man has descended. His origin is very high. He doesn't know it. From the borders of the form and the formless. In On Education he writes this. That we have to invoke a force from beyond the borders of the form and the formless. It's that border at which Ashwapati stands and that border is so beautifully described. Only a formless form of self was left. Was left a tenuous ghost of something that had been the last experience of a lapsing wave before it sinks into a boneless sea. As if it kept even on the brink of naught, the bare feeling of the ocean whence it came. So it's that experience when if it goes inside, it's lost. And that's why Mother says our goal is not to annul ourselves, but to manifest the divine perfection upon earth. So we have to take that station somewhere there, from where an entire being can be new made. If we plunge in that state, it's gone forever. It's finished. Yeah. As if it kept even on the brink of naught, 
its bare feeling of the ocean whence it came a vastness brooded free from sense of space an everlastingness cut off from time a strange sublime inalterable peace inalterable peace silent rejected from it world and soul and soul. even the sense of a separate soul because the moment you enter into it it's annulled so it it's like about it's these that spot you know which is famously mentioned in buddha's mahayan buddhism not all branches of buddhism that he stood on the threshold and then he looks back upon creation and life and says no i refuse to merge into it but if you go there it's gone all the sense of an individual soul even that is gone so it stands on the borders of that only semi humorously when shubhendra was asked about it he said the only thing is you won't have the joy of entering into that state because well <laughs> you are gone there is no you there is no experience anymore it's just gone so but well there are beings who are called upon for that there are others who are called upon for this and what shubhendra defines it as at one place he says my aim is not to create mutts or monasteries but to call the souls of the strong to the leela of krishna and kali so there are souls which are not strong enough they can't bear the pressure of creation and they choose to exit and they have a door but that door is not easy to reach not like you know nirvana in 14 days give 2000 dollars and you get nirvana even that is not easy shubhendra says no yoga is easy even the yoga of world shunning asceticism is not easy or we have the other choice of manifesting the divine fullness here in creation and even on the sunlit path yes there will be problems after all it's a big challenge it's a great adventure and and it fills your heart it's like a tonic to the soul what life would be you know what will be its worth if there is no challenge to it <laughs> so it's it's a great challenge and there is a joy of that challenge a stark companionless reality answered at last to his soul's passionate search passionless wordless absorbed in its fathomless hush keeping the mystery none would ever pierce it brooded inscrutable and intangible what is that mystery of mysteries he reaches at the door but it it speaks nothing it as if receives nothing it just like a supreme witness of all creation everything is going into it emerging out of it going back into it emerging out like the ocean unrolling itself but what is there in the depth of the ocean heart who can know so who would be us facing him with its dumb tremendous calm all that he experiences is that tremendous calm hush and where nothing else is there it had no kinship with the universe there was no act no movement in its vast life's question met by its silence died on her lips all over questionings why is this why is that my life cosmic life all the questions the moment you reach there they vanish there are no questions there are mystics who say that all these questions are creation of the mind you go beyond they cease that's very easy to say but you know real life as we experience and that's the beauty of shurbindo that he enters into its deeps into that fathomless heart and that's where the divine mother reveals himself herself to him and he brings all the answers to the riddle of creation but first thing that you encounter is that there is no riddle that is the riddle we got it wrong that's how you get the experience this was not the riddle this was the riddle and then you enter and that's the end of everything yes. 
the world's effort ceased convinced of ignorance convicted convicted of ignorance so this you know your question it's an ignorant question now you see what used to happen with someone like raman maharishi you were mentioning yesterday you go and ask him any question and he would primarily focus on who am i focus on that so paul brunton had gone there and he uh, he had this all these questions and slowly they ceased and he kept on raising in his mind uh, he was thinking of who am i then suddenly this question came looking at shri raman maharishi who are you <laughs> and he opened his eyes and there was nobody vanished yeah. like that nothingness had taken a form for the sake of so that is one kind of approach i think temi was about 17 when she went to him with her father oh and her father said you formulate all your questions and he will answer all of them she got in there and he's on the dais she never asks a word <laughs> that's it no. this sees it's like you know many of the questions which yeah. we raise at kindergarten yeah. what do parents answer not in the school but parents when they keep asking pen so you will understand when you grow up that simple as that but well the questions are valid you can't invalidate them so there is a whole line of mysticism which invalidates creation the questions the riddle everything you call it pain well it's an illusion but the pain experienced is so real and that's where the beauty of shurbindo he gives an answer to the cosmic riddle but that comes little later right now he is describing that experience which some mystics had and they regarded it as the ultimate experience finding no sanction of supernal light there was no mind there with its need to know there was no heart there with its with its need to love all person perished in its namelessness you have a question when you were not there what is the question so it vanishes there was no second it had no partner or peer only itself was real to itself you know this is exactly what we have the description of the great purusha in the vedantic scripture ekam eva dvitiyam one without a second a pure existence safe from thought and mood but it exists it's not a nothingness in that sense that there is no existence there is existence pure existence the original existence a consciousness of unshared immortal bliss so it is existence it is consciousness it is bliss self existent it dwelt aloof in its bare infinite one and unique unutterably soul and now comes a very important line because very often people when they speak of this existence they speak of tao or par brahman they take it that okay that's they so there is no being yeah. when you speak of being you have actually limited but actually always it sounded to me a logical paradox if there is existence which is conscious of itself it is a being by definition it's not a being in the sense that we portray a god who is up there sitting with a carrot and a stick counting our deeds and misdeeds <laughs> that obviously that being is far beyond all this but if there is an existence fully conscious of itself it's a being that's how we come to know even at a limited level about ourselves we become aware of who about ourselves in some subjective space so the next line is a being a being formless featureless and mute you could can give it a form you may make countless forms of him describe him by all the qualities that we can still you cannot exhaust he will still remain something unknowable and sri arbindo capitalizes being oh, yes he is the being that knew itself by its own timeless self so that's why it's like when people ask how do you know god you know god only by identity there is no other way if you don't identify you cannot know how do you identify well by the grace it is the lord at the, you reach a point where 
he has to identify his consciousness with yours. He had never lost it. We had lost it because of the veil of separation. And you discover that unity. When you discover that unity, you know that much which he allows you to know. There is no other way of knowing. Yes, there is a stage and a place for all debates and discussions because human mind cannot straight away reach, take that leap. And all this prepares, makes the mind vast and complex, but also creates problems. <laughs> but there come a time when all these become quiet. And you know because he knows himself and he, you, your consciousness becomes one with him. Aware forever in its motionless depths, uncreating, uncreated and unborn. Now here comes a very interesting line. He is uncreated, unborn is understandable. Uncreating is motionless. So where did creation come from? It emerged from him. But if you ask him, you created it? He's, there is no answer to that. Of course, there is a power within, but Ashwapati encounters that power later. But your first experience is that it is emerging and vanishing. The one by whom all live, who lives by none. So all of us are miniature Satchidananda. All of us are a limited existence. All of us are a limited consciousness. And all of us experience a limited if you may use the word bliss. So because we experience it in a limited way, but deep within intuitively we know that it is infinite. So we are always seeking for infinite existence. First by expanding our physical empire, then other kinds of empire. We also seek infinite consciousness, infinite, there is no end of knowledge, no end of power. And we seek infinite bliss. And the disparity between the two is the cause of all our experience of dualities of pain and pleasure, happiness and sorrow. Because we experience this limited thing, but we are also deep within aware of the unlimited, limitless, out there, here within, and we seek it. We don't know, we don't have the means. So for a long time, we live with these dualities in ignorance and suffer. But then a time comes when we know that the real thing, what is the real thing and how we can arrive at that, then the real journey begins. An immeasurable, luminous secrecy. But as I said, each half a phrase is so inspiring. The one by whom all live. You know, if we can just reflect upon this state and take the truth of these words within ourselves, what do we live by? hundred answers but the true real answer is by the divine the day we realize it life changes the one by whom all live who lives by none an immeasurable luminous secrecy guarded by the veils of the unmanifest so this is the other term which comes that there is the manifest creation and what is behind what is inside the Supreme Purusha? Unmanifest. It is not yet manifested. But there is something. It's like a poet's heart. So often we can use this as like, you know, when Valmiki had not written the Ramayana, was he not the same Valmiki? Yes, he was the same Valmiki. Or Vyasa the Mahabharata. But the moment he expresses, you have the manifest Vyasa in the form of Mahabharata. And lot more which is inside the heart of Vyasa, which perhaps none can know. And there's a beautiful story about that. You know, when Vyasa had written everything, yet he was not satisfied. There's something which is, you know, troubling him. So Narada has to always go, divine messenger. And he says, I know the cause of your suffering. There is something within you which wants to manifest, but you have not manifested. So he says, what is it? I know there is something, but I can't put my finger on it. What is it? He says, the story of the Lord. That's how the Bhagavat is born. Because there is something which is there inside, which is not manifested. So you see, this uh, manifestation and unmanifest, they are not two different things. They are one 
continuity we create a opposition so many of these uh, um, great mystics they said oh manifest world it's so imperfect but the unmanifest perfection is there and they but it's one continuity out of the manifestation is constantly growing progressing moving it's not a closed thing universe is expanding open energy systems to use you know uh, scientific terminology so from the manifest constantly things are flowing into the manifestation to make it more and more perfect and there is no end to this perfection supramental perfection is only one step but a crucial step so when you look at it like this then life becomes very fascinating so we create this division but this division is not not there in in reality guarded by the veils of the unmanifest above the changing cosmic interlude abode supreme immutably the same a silent cause oh, this is the original cause so c capital a silent cause occult impenetrable infinite eternal unthinkable alone so this is why you know when people were asked that what is this creation some declared is a illusion some said the original cause is desire and some said it's a leela without knowing what this leela is about or one could say it is just the unfolding of the delight which is within the heart of the one so it's a cause but actually speaking it's not a cause in the sense we understand it's a constant emergence from that one of the infinite delight which goes and becomes this creation that's why we see one thing which is a common sign of everything as a constant thread consciousness is little more difficult to touch but what is easier to touch is joy of existence see even the material world the mountains the rivers and you can feel that joy see the world of trees yeah. animals you can feel the joy but when it comes to human beings it become difficult mind you <laughs> <laughs> the mind puts a veil and see, when yeah this world was built by delight <laughs> delight it's nothing but delight unfolding itself now where does pain come in because the delight that the form can hold is always limited and therefore it always knows its limitation and seeks the limitless that becomes the cause of all this struggle and suffering and uh, seeking and finding and losing and seeking etc etc the day we have a form which is supple, supple enough wide enough to constantly receive that delight and increase its receptivity shobindo says that it must keep on increasing its receptivity and he says that there is no such form and therefore he gives uh, you know that surrender to the divine mother why it's important so it has to keep on increasing its receptivity and suppleness so that's the only way that you can become a privy to the infinite delight while in the form through the form otherwise most uh, human beings have to withdraw into a bliss of trance and then they come back when they come back it's the same world but they've experienced or tasted something which is of you know infinite value but to experience it while waking in all the activities that was mother's experience she says that she says that you know mystics hold these views one is that they say these are mundane activities and she describes it like sweeping the floor cooking and they say this is nothing sacred about it so this is one type of activity and then they say there is meditation in meditation you come in contact with that reality then she says there are other kind of people who are more religious oriented and they say that this activity is a preparation i can do it as a service of god mother says but my experience is neither of these something still further all this is delight all this is delight and that will be the supramental experience she once one place says you know it's the developed mind people with a developed mind they will be the most difficult people those who have worked upon themselves they are the most difficult because they are very hardened ego 
whereas others like flowers like children even material things they respond very fast then she gives an example what is her example says you know water from the tap the toothpaste the flow they were all dancing in joy yeah it's experience described commonest activity where is he not but mind wails because it wants to cut into parts by its nature actually that that's a problem mind by its nature has to divide things into finite sections that's how it un understands manageable bits that's why it has the particle theory is mind <laughs> wave theory is consciousness <laughs> it cannot look at things in a continuity it has to lose itself it has to enter into another dimension of consciousness but the moment it breaks it into parts and makes it finite it loses that infinity and it suffers and struggles so this is the problem with the mind so she says those who have worked upon themselves oh big egos <laughs> we may think oh they are great people no they have done tapasya and effort of course tapasya is there but of a very different kind not the tapasya as we understand sitting with both the hands someone asked me recently i look the eyes you know for me it is natural to just sit like this and you know i enter and it's so beautiful but i see people sitting like this you know so i don't know am i supposed to do this i said don't even look at them <laughs> don't even look at them <laughs> you don't become stiff when you practice yoga you become supple <laughs> you become humble if you are remembering a posture then you have forgotten god so i am putting it <laughs> a bit paradoxically in fact when you forget yourself your experience your meditation your life your your that is the time infinity reveals itself so we'll stop here at end of canto 1 and we have a very beautiful canto we'll start um, yes. on sunday um, closer to the lord's birthday yes it's canto to the adoration of the divine mother so ashupati is standing on the edge now he has a choice it's like a promo mm. <laughs> of course <laughs> we all know what's going to come he is compelled to a tremendous choice like many of the mystics he can annul himself end of all issues end of effort end of suffering end of pain end of joy limited joy the end of everything and it can absorb it won't make a difference to the supreme or he can remake himself but how to remake himself he does not know and he waits on beings naked edge that's how shivendu describes it so we'll take a pause and continue on coming sundays